All right. Good afternoon. Well, welcome to AnyCon. Um, I'm especially honored to have you all here today. Um, it's been a uh, it's been a rough year in InfoSec this year. Um, first, with the passing of uh, InfoSec luminary Becky Bass, um, and then with uh, Dennis Ritchie passing away again. And uh, and worst of all, DEF CON, I don't know if anybody's heard, but DEF CON's been canceled this year. Um, but deserving of not, deserving of it or, or not, uh, the most disastrous media coverage in InfoSec this year has resolved, uh, revolved around um, the DNC hacks. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome you all to my new talk, Hacks, Lies, and Nation States. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mario Di Natale. And according to the FBI, I am the top cybersecurity and incident response expert in my state. Um, however, as incredibly flattered by that endorsement as I am, um, you shouldn't be all that impressed by it. And uh, during this talk, you will learn why. Uh, you will also learn why the FBI's report of the DNC hack was fatally flawed. Um, how to identify and avoid some of the uh, snake oil and scams that are prevalent in our industry. And when we are done, you'll have a real understanding of our government's true cybersecurity capabilities and what we as hackers can do to help. Um, at a very young age, I got hooked on drugs. And this was my drug of choice. Uh, this is a visualization of two modems connecting. And I've never been able to get enough of it, and it completely rules over my life. Uh, in my early adolescence, I was obsessed with playing BBS games. And I'm probably dating myself here, um, but for the younger hackers in the audience that don't know what those are, uh, they were like little mini internets that we could chat and play games on. And the, uh, the problem with most BBSs was that they only had one connection, so you would get kicked off after a certain amount of time so that others could get on and, and, and play their games and download their files and wares and whatever else they wanted. Uh, so that's when I had the idea to start playing games on multiple BBSs at the same time. So as soon as I got kicked off one, I could just jump onto the next one and keep playing. So in my child's mind, uh, the logical next step was to have my computer dial every phone number in the 203 area code looking for new BBSs. Uh, what I found instead was a connection into a corporation called Bristol Myers Squibb. And, uh, and a, few, a few password guesses later, I discovered something far more thrilling than any BBS game. I discovered what I'd been put on this earth to do. Uh, it wasn't too much longer after that, I was finding ways to jump from an early service provider called Prodigy uh, out to the internet without paying for it, uh, which was great because um, I love the internet, but I was, I was eight years old, so there was definitely no way I could afford to pay for it. Um, it was also around this time that I became obsessed with these, Cray supercomputers. The problem was for a kid that couldn't afford to pay for internet access, there was definitely no way I could afford to pay for a $5 million supercomputer. But I needed to play with one. The idea of it consumed me. I really had no clue what I'd even do with one of these, but I became obsessed with getting access to one. And eventually I did. Um, as it turns out, the only people that could afford these bad machines were exactly who you'd think. Um, so first I started working my way into the NSA, uh, looking for theirs, but I couldn't find it. Found other things, but not their cray. Um, at which point I went after NASA. And I had much better success finding and gaining access to theirs. Um, don't act like you all didn't have root at JPL at one time or another either. Uh, <laughs> uh, one day I was trying to figure out how to get my password cracking programs to compile on NASA's cray. And uh, my mom walked in on me and asked me to clean my room. And without even asking, uh, without even thinking about it, I, uh, I blurted back, Ma, I'm busy hacking NASA right now. Could you please shut the door? <laughs> Predictably, my mother freaked out. <laughs> 
She told me the FBI was going to come and lock me up, which was terrifying for a computer addicted preteen. Because if I got arrested, there was definitely not going to be any time for BBS games. So I did what any reasonable kid would do. I ran a counterintelligence campaign on the FBI. <laughs> uh, first, I started searching through and reading their emails. Uh, but that was basically pointless because it was mostly office gossip and um, cat pictures. Uh, but their field agents were using radios and cell phones. So um, first I tried listening to their radio transmissions with a scanner. Um, but that didn't pan out because even back then they were, they were using encrypted radios. Um, so logically for me, the next step was to hack the phone company, obtain the billing records for the local FBI field office, reprogram an Oki 900 to monitor and record all their numbers. Um, it actually became a common occurrence at my house for my father to yell at me to, um, to stop spying on the FBI and finish my homework. Uh, eventually, my paranoia subsided when I realized the feds had no idea that I even existed. Not a clue. Uh, and that's when I became more brazen with this particular trick. Um, this slide is actually of me at the DEF CON hacker convention. Um, we were attempting to spy on the feds who we thought were spying on us. Um, we never actually found any feds. We found a lot of uh, tourists and call girls. And eventually, uh, a buddy of mine hacked the hotel PBX. We started playing their phone calls over the hotel PBX, <laughs> um, which is when the reporters started going crazy. And uh, the um, ABC actually came over and uh, tried to take my, uh, my picture and that's when the founders, um, the founder of the convention, Jeff Moss, who's better known as the Dark Tangent, uh, interceded and um, realized that I was a minor and ABC was trying to take a picture of a minor at the time. And he basically prevented that and only allowed them to take a picture of my hands. But um, after this photo was taken, I did up uh, having to take a hiatus from hacking for a short period of time. Um, but not, not for the reasons you're thinking. The, the feds actually never busted me. Uh, my school did. Um, you see, the, the reason I had so much time for cyber shenanigans was because I could hack into guidance at my school to change my attendance records and my grades. Um, I accomplished this with a little assistance from a program called Loft Crack, uh, put out by the hacker group Loft. And we'll address why they're so important in a minute. Um, but well, one day we had this teacher who had suspicions that two students had cheated on a test and he told us all that if we didn't turn them in, that the, he would fail the whole class. Um, now this was a college preparatory school, so they didn't actually ever fail anyone. What that threat meant was that <clears throat> the whole class would have to go to summer school and then we would have to accept the grade that we got in summer school. Uh, which was a major problem for me because I had big plans to go to hacker conventions that summer. So in my mind, uh, the solution was very simple. Uh, instead of just changing my grades this time, I would just change the entire class's grades from F to A's and, and boom, no, no summer school for anyone. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I made the crucial mistake of telling some panned classmates what I did at lunchtime. They told some people who told some people and then, and then that happened. Um, but I was fine, they, they didn't expel me. Um, they did ban me from touching computers for the rest of my time uh, at high school, but uh, you know it was fine. Um, I just had to earn my grades for myself. But uh, you know I went to a great college. Uh, I went on to, to do very well in, in CS, and I went on honing my, my cybersecurity skills in my classes. I worked for a bunch of great startups where I built a multitude of secure systems for both private sector and government agencies. And um, now we have to fast forward to last year, where I was the chief information officer for the city of Hamden, which is the second or third largest city in, in the state of Connecticut. Um, we got hit by these guys bad. Uh, first, they hit our police department, but I had just recently built that system out. We were able to recover very quickly. No real ma major damage done. Uh, I reported it to the FBI, and their team seemed interested, but not, not that interested. Um, but the Tesla Crypt guys, they, uh, they weren't too happy about not, not collecting that ransom. 
So then they went after the town systems and I was still in the process of, of, of modernizing that infrastructure and, and securing it. So this time the damage was, was slightly more dramatic. And this time they were asking for a half million dollars worth of Bitcoins. Um, as bad as it was, uh, my team and I worked through the night. Uh, we got the town back up and running. We lost about a day's work. Not, not too shabby. Um, and then these guys got really mad. Um, they started pounding us with floods of email, uh, attacking users that hadn't even existed. Uh, the load was so high, it overwhelmed the spam server. Um, when that didn't work, they started hitting us with distributed denial of service attacks. The situation was rapidly getting ugly, and our mayor asked me to reach out to the FBI again and see if there was anything that they could do. And um, the feds informed me that it was very unlikely they could do anything as we hadn't paid the ransom. We hadn't incurred any monetary loss. Um, <laughs> correct, sir. I was assured that they had an open investigation into the Tesla Crypt group based out of their Las Vegas field office and that dozens of agents have been working the case since last year. But that didn't help Hamden's situation at all. The water was coming in faster than me and my understaffed team could bail it out. The entire town's productivity was dropping and my team and I were all pretty much convinced we were going to lose our jobs. Uh, we were rapidly um, approaching the event horizon. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like this. So with the city under attack, I took a sample of their malware from Hamden and rushed it to my home lab. I isolated it, I reverse engineered it, and I found a critical flaw. A critical flaw that allowed me to seize control over their entire command and control architecture. And I used that control to lock them out, shut down the attack, and trace their connections back to them. I gave them a taste of their own medicine, and it only took me about two hours from start to finish. In fact, I spanked them so hard, they apologized to the entire internet the next day. <laughs> The following week, I made an appointment with the FBI. I handed over all their addresses to them. At first, the FBI didn't really know what to make of it. They, uh, I think in the beginning, they thought I might have been in on it. They, they kind of grilled me for a little bit. But you know, uh, after a little while, they knew I was one of the good guys. And they were very happy to uh, accept the data that I provided them. And um, that's when they instantly put me in their InfraGuard program and named me one of their type, top app, uh, cybersecurity assets in that area. So I was pretty thrilled about that. Active disclaimer. I don't recommend doing what I did. Hackbacks are not a good idea. They're not standard operating procedure. Um, this is not a good example of standard incident response. But uh, sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures. And it's what I had to do to protect my users. So. So now the question that you all should be asking yourselves is, why did something that only took me two hours to solve have the FBI chasing its tail for over a year? Um, and to understand that, we actually have to travel back in time uh, to May 19th, 1998. Uh, to me, I think this is the pivotal day in cybersecurity history that the US government seeded its lead in the cyber skills arms race. The Washington Post will later go on to call this event a tragedy of missed opportunity. From left to right, you have Brian Oblivion, Tan, Kingpin, Mudge, Weld Pond, Space Rogue, and Stefan Von Neumann. Together, they made up a hacker group called The Loft. And they have been described as the hacker version of the Beatles, with, uh, with Mudge acting as John Lennon and Weld Pond being uh, regarded as the Paul McCartney. Uh, aside from members of the Federal Witness Protection Program, no one else has ever been allowed to testify in front of Congress uh, with their pseudonyms. 
And uh, on this day in the May of 98, they delivered a terrifyingly accurate prophecy of the cyber threat landscape that we all currently occupy. In front of a bipartisan group of senators, including John Glenn, Joseph Lieberman, and Fred Thompson, Mudge said, quote, your computers are not safe, not the hardware, not the networks, and not the networks that link them together. The companies that build these things don't care, and they have no reason to care, because failure costs them nothing. And the federal government has neither the skill nor the will to do anything about it. If you're looking for computer security, then the internet is not the place to be. The internet itself could be taken down by any of the seven individuals seated before you with 30 minutes of well choreographed keystrokes, end quote. To which Senator Fred Thompson then responded, we're gonna to have to do something about this. But um, nothing was ever done about it, believe it or not. And we're all paying the price for that today. So instead of immediately seizing onto the opportunity to build a bridge with the hacker community and facilitating a knowledge transfer, the government has year after year demonized and ostracized hackers by naming them the number one threat to America, higher than Al Qaeda and higher than ISIS. Now, before I go any further, I have to tell you all that I actually love the FBI. This is not a knock on them as an organization. Um, they're a really great organization to work with, actually. And that's why I donate all my free time uh, participating with their InfraGuard program, which is charged with protecting all of our nation's critical infrastructure. And I encourage everyone in the room to um, get involved and do everything you can to help secure everything from power plants to water supplies to power grids. Um, but if the feds were so outgunned trying to solve a fairly simple case for the city of Hamden, why do we think that the feds are definitively capable of telling us that Russian hackers were involved with a compromise of John Podesta's emails during the last election? And the answer is the FBI didn't actually tell us that the Russians were involved in the election they regurgitated some really terrible and fundamentally flawed data. And it really wasn't their fault. They really just didn't know any better. And that's an indictment of the cybersecurity industry as a whole. Uh, follow me down the rabbit hole. Let's see how deep this goes. So allegedly the hack started with Podesta receiving an email message that looked like it came from Google asking him to change his password. And he did, he provided the hackers, if you can even call them that, hackers, all the access they needed to dump his emails. Keep in mind, this version of the story is highly and strongly disputed by WikiLeaks, who claimed that the emails were leaked to them by a fellow staffer. However, if true, this is not a particularly sophisticated attack. In fact, this barely qualifies as hacking. Uh, it's so in, unsophisticated that I'm pretty certain I could teach anyone in this room how to do it in under an hour. So right off the bat here, we're already seeing red flags that this sort of attack doesn't even come close to the level of sophistication that we're used to seeing from Russian state actors. Weld Pond of Loft immediately voiced his skepticism on Twitter before the report even dropped. And then very shortly thereafter, we find out that the FBI actually didn't perform their own forensics in this case. An external company named CrowdStrike did. Now, let's not be too critical of the FBI here. They clearly realized that they had a, um, a skills gap. They knew that they were incapable of performing this work themselves, reach out to a private sector cybersecurity company for help. And this is great. We want to encourage more of this. However, the FBI probably should have been a bit more careful in vetting their contractor for this particular job because, ouch, yes. Uh, 
maybe somebody should have investigated that conflict of interest. But hey, maybe, maybe this isn't as bad as it seems. Actually, it's worse. <laughs> we wouldn't find out until much later that the FBI didn't just rely on CrowdStrike. They were forced to by the DNC. I'm not even sure how that's democratic or legal, but it is apparently. But hey, maybe CrowdStrike did a really thorough job and wrote a really great report. Some traffic may correspond to malicious activity, and some may correspond to legitimate activity. <sighs> what? That's an actual quote from the report, which makes as much sense to me as that scene from um, Dumb and Dumber, where Lloyd turns to Harry and with like absolute certitude informs him that he can't triple stamp a double stamp. But as I and many others apparently noticed, a good portion of the IPs offered up as evidence in the report are clearly not even in the Russian IP space. In fact, more than half of them are located in America. 20% of them are Tor exit nodes. Six of them are Yahoo email servers. Yes. This report is actually that bad. It adds nothing for the call for evidence that the Russian government was responsible for hacking the DNC, the DCC, the email accounts of Democratic Party officials, or for delivering the content of those hacks to WikiLeaks. It merely listed every threat group ever reported on by a commercial cybersecurity company that is suspected of being Russian made and lumped them under the heading of Russian intelligence services without providing any supporting evidence that such a connection existed. Worse still, the list, reported Russian in, the, list, the list of reported Russian intelligence names included general and often unrelated software family names and extremely broad and non-descriptive classifications of capabilities such as, quote, PowerShell. True story. It was a bizarre conglomerate of data types that didn't meet any objective in the report and only added confusion as to whether the DHS or FBI really knew what they were doing. Whatever the FBI paid for this report or the DNC paid for this report, we should really ask for our tax money back. All this report really proved was that it was incompetently put together. So on the one hand, we have the FBI reaching out for help which is fantastic. But on the other hand, we have, quote, cybersecurity companies completely taking advantage of and misleading their clients with baseless conclusions. All right, for those of you that don't know, the GCHQ is the UK's version of our NSA. And they've apparently come around to the same sentiment that myself and my fellow hackers have been trying to espouse for years. Namely, that cybersecurity companies are shilling snake oil Proxies simply don't work as promised, but they get people and companies to buy them by spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The worst offender in this industry are the antivirus vendors. Let's start by saying that antivirus software is a relic and no longer relevant to running a secure system. In fact, more often than not, it does the opposite. Virus and malware authors have outpa outpaced the AV industry as a whole. In fact, most of the AV we see out in the wild right now are polymorphic. Polymorphic is just another way of saying that the virus changes every time it copies itself so that you can't write a signature to detect it. Now, the fact of the matter is most antivirus software is so terribly written and runs with such high level privilege over your system, it actually makes it easier for us to hack that system than if it wasn't running antivirus at all. But unfortunately, that's just the beginning of the problems with antivirus because I think one of the greatest security researchers in the world right now is Tavis Ormandy working for Google's Project Zero team. He's, I consider him to essentially be the Babe Ruth of hackers right now. Whatever software he points his bat at, he's going to hit a home run. And when he pointed it at Kaspersky antivirus, he discovered in addition to making your system less secure and vulnerable to remote code execution, it was actually intercepting all encrypted, commu all encrypted communications from his computer. And 
That's something most antivirus vendors are doing right now under the guise of making your system more secure. Because they can snoop your traffic, they can inspect it. It's not. So, now, even worse than this, antivirus companies have also secretly snuck language into their EULAs that allow them to collect and sell the data they mine from your computer. Even worse, while everyone was looking for Russian hackers that may or may not have existed, we actually invited the KGB into our computers by letting our computer manufacturers pre-install antivirus for us. In 2012, Kaspersky Labs fired all their high-level managers and replaced them with people with close ties to Russia's military and intelligence services. These people are actively aiding the FSB, the KGB's successor, using data mined from Kaspersky's 400 million customers. According to former employees of Kaspersky Labs speaking under anonymity conditions for fear of retaliation, this closeness starts at the top with Eugene Kaspersky himself, who has weekly sauna sessions with five to 10 Russian intelligence officers. If you have Kaspersky antivirus installed, it's a safe bet that the FSB has a copy of your data right now, and they didn't even have to hack you. You hacked yourself. CrowdStrike again. So I hope everybody remembers these guys from the DNC report. For those of you that don't know who NSS is, NSS is an independent lab that tests and rates cybersecurity products. Um, the reports aren't exactly great, but, um, and they have their flaws, but at least they establish a general baseline for how effectively a product operates under somewhat realistic operating conditions. And just last summer, they raided a bunch of antivirus products from various vendors and were sued by CrowdStrike to prevent that report from coming out. A federal judge later struck that down and the report was published, however. And unsurprisingly, they did horribly. The product was actually so bad, for the first time ever, a product received a caution rating from NSS Labs. But at least it wasn't as bad as the report they gave the FBI, so we'll move on to bigger snake oil. Route 9B, by some metrics, is one of the largest cybersecurity companies in the world. And they absolutely love to talk up their military hacker lineage and conjure up all kinds of spycraft imagery with their slick marketing. They are also completely incompetent. <laughs> they recently wrote up a report with such nonsensical terms like zero day hashes, claiming to have identified advanced persistent threats attributable to Russian hackers that were a direct and immediate threat to all the international banking markets. However, upon Closer scrutiny, it appears as though this was nothing more than unsophisticated Nigerian fishers who'd simply registered new websites. So remember, anytime you hear military grade or intelligence grade cybersecurity like this, run away as fast as you can. Remember, these are the guys I was outwitting as a teenager, and many teenagers still are. Um, but this isn't a secret. There's plenty of evidence for it, such as, you know, 16 year olds reading the CIA director's emails or the missile defense agency failing to use crypto that even meets Google's baseline standards for consumer shopping <laughs> or whatever this is. <laughs> cool story, bro. In fact, this image should be the first thing you think of when you think military-grade cybersecurity. No, 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 that's, that's too harsh. I take it back. Maybe this is just Fox News B-roll footage and not actual footage of Cyber Command failing to type in commands that actually make sense, right? Maybe the, the first thing we think of when we think military-grade cybersecurity should be... NATO's new recruiting video making extensive use of HackerTyper.com. But hey, maybe that's, maybe that's also harsh and maybe that's also the producer's choice, right? Civil 
Okay. Whew. We want loud, offensive cyber tools. Ah, oh, that's just, that's not how this, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> this just shows a complete and fundamental misunderstanding of even the most basic principles of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is not nuclear warfare. There's no mutually assured destruction. It doesn't even apply. So it's not even a deterrent. I'm sorry, am I hurting anybody's eardrums right now? I just want to choke somebody. Offensive capabilities not reduce anybody's threat levels, right? So what we don't what we don't need any more of is this ridiculous military grade cybersecurity. What we need is more hacker grade cybersecurity. <laughs> but I think if we want to understand, I mean, hang on. Again, I don't think we can blame the military here. They're doing the best they can. They just don't know any better. And I think if we want to understand why the state of our country's cybersecurity affairs is so bad, we again have to point the finger at ourselves, at the cybersecurity industry. The industry as a whole is flush with outright frauds. Look at these statistics. This was a study published by Rapid7 this year. For those of you that don't know, which I suspect there's not many people in this room that don't know what Rapid7 produces, but for those of you that don't know, Rapid7 produces the most widely used security testing software in this industry, Metasploit. And in this survey, they found that in 41% of testing engagements, no vulnerabilities were found, not a one. And then they wrote, good for them. Good for them. Maybe. Probably not. I don't think there's anybody in this room that's ever gone on an engagement and not found even a, a zero or a one week vulnerability. It's a little, a little tough to believe. But hey, um, maybe the security tester just ran an automated tool and printed out a report and then cashed his check. I'm sorry, but that's not proper security testing. That's fraud. Most real hackers will tell you that no system is secure and given enough time, all systems can be penetrated. I've designed numerous secure systems and I'll never make the claim that any of them are 100% secure or they have no vulnerabilities because it's simply not true. What the statistic is telling me is that almost half the professionals in this industry are outright frauds. Earlier this year, I was contacted as a QA security tester for a large federal organization that have been using two of the providers in this list for their biannual security testing. And they had been paying very large sums of money for that testing. We initially slotted two days, but as it turned out, all I needed was four hours. In four hours, I had Mimikatz running on the domain controller, every username and password in clear text, complete control of all the network infrastructure, the HVAC system, and the building access control system. The picture included in this report was taken from the server room, which they believed was the most secure room in the facility. But all I needed to do to access it was use my same key card from work, input it into their key card system, and give myself access to it. And I wish I could say this was some elaborate, complicated hack, but it wasn't. This was all very basic day one security stuff that had never even bothered to have been checked. To me, this was, this was outright fraud being perpetrated by not just one, but two of the biggest companies in the industry. So where is this fraud stemming from? Is it, is it intentional or is it incompetency? And I tend to believe it's more the latter. And I, I believe this problem particularly is rooted in our vetting of cybersecurity professionals. The Certified Information System Security Professional Certification, or the CISP for short, is currently our industry standard for providing proficiency in information security. It has been formally approved by the DOD and has been adopted as the baseline for the NSA's ISEP program. Obtaining it requires that you are capable of answering 250 multiple choice questions without demonstrating any practical experience whatsoever. Now, I think we can 
all agree here that both these fighters are not created equal. They're both martial artists. That's really where the comparison should end. Which one would you rather have fighting on your side? Now, you can take a hacker and give him a CISP and have a great CISP. I won't deny that. But you can't take a non-hacker, send him to a week-long boot camp, give him a CISP, and have him be a great hacker. It just doesn't work that way. The problem is, that's exactly how our industry is operating right now. We have a lot of fake black belts running around. They talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. Amen, brother. Would you feel comfortable letting a doctor operate on you if all it took to pass medical school is a multiple choice exam? A recent Department of Homeland Security report compared cybersecurity jobs to those of pilots, physicians, and nuclear plant operators, all of which must obtain certifications that set a high bar for technical proficiency using rigorous testing as well as scenario-based testing. The current method of testing cybersecurity professionals doesn't even close, come close to meeting those strict standards and has been likened to, quote, flying a jet without going to flight school. Now, admittedly, I'm probably maybe a black belt in cyber defense, a brown belt in cyber offense at best, probably even a purple belt. But when it comes to reverse engineering, vulnerability research, cryptography, forensics, I'm a white belt. The idea that a 250 question multiple choice exam can even scratch the surface of certifying someone as an expert in all these domains is preposterous. I'm not even an expert. I've been doing this my entire life. Implying that the CISB qualifies you to work in cybersecurity is absurd. This is like implying that reading your car owner's manual qualifies you to be an automotive engineer. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of both the problems and the technology. Now, on December 8th, 2000, one day after the anniversary of the surprise Japanese attack on the US Naval Forces in 1941, National Security Council counterterrorism official Richard A. Clark appeared at a conference organized by Microsoft. He warned that if the government didn't improve computer security, the nation might suffer a digital Pearl Harbor. Ladies and gentlemen, the digital Pearl Harbor that Dick Clark spoke of is not a singular event. We are all living through it right now as a series of cascading failures. With each individual failure growing in severity and impact. President Trump has publicly stated that improving cybersecurity will be an immediate and top priority for his administration. He has also repeatedly gone on the record stating that he will hire the best people and surround himself with the best advisors possible. So clearly, <clears throat> he's going to recruit a highly respected domain expert in cybersecurity to advise his administration, right? Someone really, really great. Rudy Giuliani. Ugh. I feel like we're all living through an episode of the Twilight Zone right now. This is the same Rudy Giuliani that's already had his password stolen and leaked. The same Rudy Giuliani whose cybersecurity firm's website is a disaster of dozens of vulnerabilities and doesn't even follow the basic best practices that would be obvious to even the most casual student of cybersecurity. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the draining of the swamp that we were promised. This is not surrounding ourselves with the best and brightest and hiring the best like we were promised and yada, yada, yada. If our president is truly serious about fixing this problem, we need someone with a real specialized background in information security. We also need someone who's used to navigating the bureaucratical independencies of the government. Ladies and gentlemen, we need this guy. We need Mudge. Only, stop laughing. No, Mudge does not look like this anymore, okay? This is Mudge now, all right? Since 98, Mudge now goes by his real name, Peter Zacto. 
And from 2010 to 2013, he was a project manager at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, where he worked on several cybersecurity initiatives. In fact, in 2013, he received the Office of the Secretary of Defense's Exceptional Public Service Award. And following his stint at DARPA, he joined Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Group, which is Google's in-house Skunk Works team. If ever there was a person more capable of leading this nation's cybersecurity initiatives, surely this is the one we want. Albeit he has a pretty sick job at Stripe right now, the government probably can't afford him, but it's a pretty good one, all right? Let's ask him at least. Everyone encourage a congressperson to reach out. I encourage every person in this room to reach out to their politicians and tell them that this administration needs to sprinkle a little more hacker on it, all right? Now, the last thoughts I'd like to leave you with are this. There are no silver bullets in cybersecurity. There are no guarantees. And stop letting companies that promise these things scare you into buying their products. Thank you. You all can leave now. No, I'm just kidding. Questions? Shoot. I agree. And I said that to a three star general, and he goes, You can hack my phone. It's done. <laughs> Yeah, again, I like to reiterate that I'm not, I'm not banging on them. They're doing the best they can. Unfortunately, um, it's, it's going to take a lot, from the hacker, a lot of pressure from the hacker community on the cybersecurity industry itself before that will trickle down and we'll see that, that change happen. And it's gonna take, it's gonna t I'm sure it's going to take years for that to happen. It's taken years for them to get to the point where they are now where they're actually trying to recruit hackers instead of shoot us. All right, cool. Everybody go have a drink. I'll see you at the bar. And thank you for coming. I appreciate it.